Well, I want to go into part two of Go and Tell. And we are in something special, a special season, a special series. The Holy Spirit is doing great things. And so just engage tonight and let the word get planted deep in your heart. We want to be an effective church for followers and explorers. We want to be an effective church for followers, so we're going to feed followers of Jesus to the best of our ability. Every time we gather like this, through the group life of the church, where there is the presence of the Lord, the formation through the word of God in community. We also want to be effective in reaching people that are lost. Amen? We want everybody to know Jesus as their personal Savior. And so we've got to be a place where we can help people that are on a journey, people that are asking questions. So we come tonight to say, how do we go and tell effectively? And I'm going to give you four things from the passage. We're going to go back momentarily to the book of John, and I'm going to do what's called uh, an exegesis. We're going to exegete the passage. We're just going to go line by line. And I, I hope the Holy Spirit just grips you with how relevant the word is because it is. The word is fresh. The word is as relevant as anything could possibly be because it's a living word. And here we are in 2024, and the Bible is going to show us exactly how to reach people that are lost in this current reality. So I want to give you four words. Here we go. And you may want to jot these down. Friendship, empathy, invitation, and faith. Friendship, empathy, invitation, and faith. These four things equip us as we have a passion to reach people who need Jesus. So first John, I'm sorry, John chapter one, starting at verse 43. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee, finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Verse 44, Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathaniel. Philip and Nathaniel were friends. So Phil found Nate and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth, can any good come from there? Nathaniel asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathaniel approaching, he said of him, now here is truly an Israelite in whom there's no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Holy Spirit, equip us and empower us so that we can reach our friends that are lost. Teach us about empathy, invitation, and faith as we go and tell in Jesus' name. And everybody put a strong amen right there. Amen. So number one, friendship. Friendship. Philip followed Jesus and no sooner has his life been revolutionized, now he's going and telling. And he's going to his friend, Nate, as the scripture says here, Nathaniel. Throughout all church history, we know that the biggest percentage of people that end up following Jesus, they start doing so because of the witness of a friend. Friends trust you. Friends respect you. Even if they disagree with you, they know you. So I want to put this word here under friendship. It's the word authentic. We want to be authentic 
which means we're not going to hide who we are. Being real as Christians means we will not hide our Christianity. We will not put this light under a covering. We're going to let the light shine. No hiding, but no forcing. We're not going to force it on somebody, but we're not going to hide it. It would be authentic as you're interacting with your friend tomorrow or Monday to say something like this. Church at the Rose District on Saturday night was awesome. And they go, really? Yeah. And you don't have to say any more. Don't hide it. Uh, Jesus is doing something in your life. Don't hide it. Talk about night to shine if you were there and the love of Jesus that you saw. Just authentic. I said it last week. First and foremost, if I'm going to be an effective witness, there has to be a fresh work of Jesus happening in me so that I'm not marketing Jesus. I'm not trying to place a product. I'm not trying to market the church. I'm simply telling you what's happening in my life, not hiding it, because if it really happens, you can't hide it, but you don't want to have to force it. Let's think of it like this. Here it is. Good news gets out. Good news gets out. Uh, give me a shout out on this if you like coffee. Where's your favorite coffee? Oh, that, I didn't even get to the shout out. That was awesome. Okay. Where, what's your favorite place to get coffee? A bunch of different places, which I expected. And, and if you like it as much as Andy Briley likes it, uh, this guy will tell you where. See what I'm saying? Because that's good news to him. You've probably told people about your favorite place. Go see a movie and you love it. The good news about that to you, it just gets out. You don't keep it to you. Hey, have you seen this movie? Oh, you should see. I've seen it five times. See, you know what I'm saying? This restaurant or uh, things like that. Good news just gets out. I kept running into people. This was a couple of years ago, and it's only grown. Have you played pickleball? And do you, do you hear that sound? Now, a few years ago, that was not being asked. Now it's, it's like, it, it must be awesome because people love it, and the good news is getting out. That's why we're going to have pickleball courts in our new activity center. Come on and see. So... How much more, how much more, if good news gets out, and we just went over just practical areas where it does, how much more should we go and tell people the answer of the longing of their heart? This area is full of people searching, and we just get to say, hey, come and see. And we're talking about our story. We're talking about things that are just so real and they will appeal for years. In John 1, we see the culmination that for years they had waited and watched and looked for the Messiah. They were looking for deep answers. They had heard about this one and so they found him and Philip goes immediately and says to Nathaniel, you know, the one that Moses wrote about, one that's greater than the law. We found him, like the Messiah. We found him. Now here's number two, empathy. And the first thing that, Peter, that Nate does is say, hold up though. You said he comes from Nazareth. What good can possibly come from Nazareth? The real story is that Jesus comes from God. But in the human experience, we often get hung up with things like Nazareth. Why is there suffering? What's the meaning of life? That's our Nazareth. Geographically in that day, it was such a small place. And so for Nate, Nathaniel, a very religious man, he can't imagine that finally, if the Messiah has come, surely 
He would be from Jerusalem. See, in, watch, in his own mind, he can't connect it. It's just not adding up. It's, it's not feeling like the Messiah to him and for his reason was locational because of how steeped in religion he was. Nazareth, can anything good come from Nazareth? And Philip does not challenge him about having a question. He was totally comfortable with Nathaniel's question. And here is this next part about being a witness, that we're not afraid of questions. That when our friends ask these big questions, we welcome them. Hey, good question. Let's figure it out. The come and see is where we explore. It's why we want to be a church that feeds followers, but a church that loves and helps explorers. Those that are trying to figure out empathy is where I'm not going to back away from your question and I'm not going to criticize you for having a question and the church must be a place and believers must be people that are safe places and people to ask honest questions. That was an honest question that Nathaniel was asking. Like, are you telling me that Messiah, the one greater than Moses, the one greater than the law, it, Nazareth, that was as real to him as are the questions that people would ask today like this, like, I've been so hurt. And they follow with the question, how can God be God and how can God be good if, if this has happened? And we don't write that off. We empathize because that's what a good witness will do. There's been so much that has happened in the church world. There is now in culture the rise of pluralism. I even saw where a guy that has written a book just released on discipleship. He is a godly man. He is a student of the word. It's a book of profound, rich truth. And one of the comments was this, if this is another book that Jesus is the only way, then don't waste your money. Why would a person make that comment? Because we have had the rise of pluralism in our culture. Sharing Jesus in this cultural moment is different than it was 10 years ago. It's not, it was hard then. It, it took the anointing of the Spirit. It took the leading of the Spirit. It took the work of Jesus and a willing church then. It's going to take it now. But we do have some uniquenesses to sharing Jesus in this generation. So we get to be students. We get to be wise. We, get, we, we are going to be equipped so that in this moment, we can effectively tell our friends in the Tulsa region and beyond, the good news. We can do this, and we can do this effectively. And here Philip is teaching us, just an exegesis of the passage, is that you don't write off the questions. You empathize. You make place for them. You invite people to a place where they can discuss them. Because here's the bottom line. Empathy will lead to invitation. Will you put up my next slide? Let me just show you some questions here. Some people are just unaware of the story or they're not as aware as they, they need to be to make a choice. Some have had a toxic situation. Some have been rejected. Some, the whole idea of Christianity, it's just unpopular to them. Not that they totally disagree with it, but it's just not the thing. There's experience and self-discovery. There's this whole big mantra of my truth it's a personal truth pursuit then there are those that just have massive questions like how do you know that Jesus is the Christ and how do you know that the Bible is true so why would I sell out to this without getting answers to those valid questions so as people are on their way to the cross as they're on their way 
to a relationship with Jesus, you step into that moment with empathy, saying, let's talk it out. And there comes number three in the message tonight, invitation. Invitation. Let's talk it out. On Monday night at the South Campus, we call it the South Campus Cafe, you and your friend are invited to the first session of Alpha. And Alpha is all about answering those questions. Like, is there more to life? Who is Jesus? Why did Jesus die? How can I have faith? Why is the Bible true to you? And why should I read it? Very fair questions. Important questions. And there in a setting that is effectively created, these questions in a very safe place, they're welcomed. We talk about them. 30 people were at the last interest group. So you could bring your friend or a week from Monday, you can join the next group that are going to train up to lead an alpha. And I believe we're going to have these on university campuses. We already have one student that's going to start one at TU. I believe they're going to spring up across this city. Can we catch a vision for that? And catch a vision of hundreds of people, your friends being invited into this very safe place where those questions can be effectively asked and answer. Let me remind you what Alpha is about. The team went to the streets of LA, Memphis, and New York. And here's just some of the responses to one of those big questions. Watch this. Camera speeds? Sound speeds. <laughs> <laughs> right. Go here. Matter of fact, I think a question is about. It's a good question. I ask myself this all the time. I I don't know. I have no idea. I wish I knew. I mean, um. I don't know. Nobody knows. I wish I knew. <laughs> oh, I was waiting for my son to get old enough to ask me this question. Um. Yes and no. Always. I do believe some things in the Bible are relevant today. Not all things, because the world changes every day. I think it has some good lessons and some good history and good words to put out into the world. Uh, There's some lessons in there for sure. It's, it's written very majestically. I don't really think so anymore. I'm iffy on the Bible because I know that it's been translated so many times. I do think that being good neighbors is, um, is definitely relevant in this day and age. Historical track record of who God is and who Jesus is. But I think that finding like the faith within yourself is more important than reading a book that was written 2,000 years ago. That very last person was about the personal truth, my truth. You gotta find it within yourself. Tens of thousands of people in this region would be right where she is. Let's invite them in. Let's have a conversation. Not afraid, not critical, not forcing. Let's just have an honest conversation. It's exactly what Jesus did. And when you get involved in this conversation, as we said last week, you're joining Jesus where he's already working. You're joining Jesus where he's working in someone's thoughts and their heart and their life. And it becomes the most incredible journey when we go and tell and invite people to come and see. So again, you could bring friends on Monday night because the next group starts. Or if you would like to train in to be one of those leaders and we need you, you can start on the 17th. Please prayerfully consider that. If you say, well, tell me more about Monday night. Well, you just come to the cafe. Dinner is provided. It's a great time of connection. Uh, a carefully prepared video on the first key question. And then it goes to the table time where the leaders are there ready 
to walk this out and see what God does. So are you getting just the, the, the simple yet powerful approach? Number one, we share Jesus with our friends because they have your respect. You have credibility with them because they know you. Even if they don't agree with you, they know you and they respect you. And so you share Jesus with your friends and you empathize, which means you welcome their questions. You welcome their challenges. And then number three, you invite them. You invite them to church. You invite them to a group like this. Just start inviting, asking them to be your friend or to be your guest at one of these services. And let's watch what God will do because here's number four, faith. We do all of this in faith. And I, I want you to see this next part of what happened between Phil and Nate, Nate and Jesus. So we are asking people to consider faith, to consider Christianity, to open their heart to Jesus. We are willing to say there is no other way because that is the truth. It's not mine. It's the truth. And we don't want anyone to miss a personal relationship with Jesus. We don't want them to miss a full eternity in a place called heaven. And we sure don't want them to spend their eternity in the horror of a place called hell, as the Bible defines, a lake of fire. So there's an urgency. There is a passion and intentionality that needs to be behind our empathy and our invitation with our friends. But here's the next one. We're doing this in faith because Jesus wants them saved. Jesus is still seeking those who are lost. He's still the doctor going after those who are sick. Hallelujah. He's still the shepherd that will leave the 99 and go after the one. He's the one that'll turn the house upside down. He's the father that will welcome the prodigal home. That's his heart. We're just joining him. So let's join him in faith. Now I want, I want to build your faith by you seeing what happened in this passage. It's, it, it has me. So as Nathaniel is walking before he gets to Jesus, Jesus says, I know you. He says, I know you're the Israelite. And he talks about his integrity. And then Nathaniel says, how do you know me? And then Jesus says, well, before Phil ever got to you, Nate, I saw you under the fig tree. I saw you. So now we're in the supernatural, right? Now Nathaniel's going, there's no way he could have known this unless what? He must be God. So now Nazareth is not as big a question because now the supernatural is happening. And when someone starts encountering God, their suffering, their toxic history, their rejection, their pain, it'll start finding place when they start experiencing the power of Jesus. Yeah, that, get a hold of that right there. Seven of us over there, okay. You have to get this part. This is where it's so exciting and so true. If, if you do a word search of just what's happening with this fig tree and you watch all that happened around a fig tree in the life of Jesus, there's so much happening. Jesus is letting Nathaniel know, I know you the way you've always wanted to be known. I love you the way you've always wanted to be loved. I know about you and I know about the stuff you wouldn't want anybody to know. And I still love you. And I still call you out and say, I know you. And I still talk of you as I know you can be. And see, this is the work of Jesus in someone's life. And, and Jesus does his work. He's always, if we'll just go and tell and say, come and see. Jesus will do his work. And we don't know exactly how he's going to do it. 
but he will do it and it will be profound and it will be powerful. Wow, whatever was going on with Nathaniel and it wasn't good. Jesus still welcomed him. Jesus welcomed him with honor. Jesus loved him. And this, this supernatural encounter is what caused Nathaniel to say, you are God, Rabbi, Messiah. You are the one. And so he went on, and, and you can read it if you, if you choose, as Jesus says, Nathaniel, you have no idea how great it's about to get because he's going to revolutionize his life and incorporate him in the purpose for which he was created. Just walk with Jesus through the pages of scripture and watch him approach a leper. No one else would get close to a leper and a leper couldn't get close to anyone else. That horrible condition and Jesus not only would get close, Jesus touched the leper. And so the leper is healed and there was no human answer for leprosy in that day. And when that man with leprosy got healed, he got his life back. He could work with his hands. He could sit at the table with his family. He could function in community because of the supernatural power of Jesus. Hey, Zacchaeus, you gotta come out of that tree because I'm going to your house. Wait, Zacchaeus, the tax collector, the sinner, the, the fraud, the extortioner, this guy, what are you doing with him? And Jesus had to come out of his house and say, this is why I came. But back to Zacchaeus, whatever happened in Zacchaeus' house, when he came out, he is returning upwards of 400% you don't do that unless you've been radically changed. He is now making, what, what would you call it? restitution? He is, he's going around and he's going to pay it back with interest. You don't do that unless you've been radically changed. And we've got all of humanity out there climbing trees of success, climbing trees of pursuit but because Jesus has climbed the tree, they can come down and the power of Jesus, come on church, can change them. And I just want our faith to be increased in the power of Jesus to change somebody's life. And when you look in a mirror, you have the proof. He changed you, he found you, he forgave you, he's revolutionized your life. Go tell somebody. Your friends empathize with their questions. Invite them to Jesus. Invite them to church. Invite them to Alpha. Put up my uh, picture with me, if you will, about Alpha. I skipped over that, and I'm sorry. This is Alpha. Because this is the journey. There's, there's no straight line. We work through this. Ministry is messy. Can I get an amen? Can I get a stronger amen? Ministry is messy. When you're trying to get a tax collector out of a tree, when you're trying to get a demon-possessed young man that nobody can help, that's living in a cemetery back in his right mind, when you're trying to get the church to accept Saul of Tarsus, who's been saved, my God, it's messy. This is the journey. We'll journey through the toxicity, the self-discovery, but let's just keep talking it through in faith and we're gonna end up at the cross. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Worship team, will you come help me tonight and just put back my word faith there if you will. Thank you so much. And as you see this word faith, here's what... I just pray the Holy Spirit, let me get this out of my heart in the, the fire and the, the, 
grip it has on me. When the prodigal came back, I mean, this guy, this guy knew what he was doing. He left the father's house. He wasted it. And then he comes back. And in his effort to come home and to try to try to repent, man, Jesus, who is seen through the actions of that father, is covering him and restoring him. And he says this to those around him. He says, hurry. That's what it has me. He says, hurry. And he followed with the word hurry with get the celebration ready. Hurry. Hurry. And I feel the Holy Spirit wanted me to end this message saying, let's keep hurrying. Let's keep hurrying to set up celebrations for all of these sinners who are going to come to faith like we did. Let's not lose the vision of a church that's always hurrying to celebrate one more sinner who has come home. Let's keep hurrying to the celebration where we can say, as the father, my son who is dead, he's alive again. Come on, get a vision, get a vision. And if we all start going to our friends and empathizing with their very real questions and their human experience in this cultural moment, and we will welcome those questions with an invitation to church and groups like Alpha, and we will do that in faith, we will have to hurry. We will have to hurry because people are going to be getting saved more than we have ever seen. Church, I sense something that we're at the starting line and Jesus is out there saying, let's go. Join me where I'm working. Join me. I long for a church that loves lost people. That's what Jesus is saying. I long for a church that will just let their light shine. Don't hide it. Don't force it. Just authentically let your light shine. Oh, it's awesome, isn't it? Stand with me, everybody. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Oh, there's something strong in this place. Lord, we're ready. You have stirred us with the power of your word. You've equipped us to go do the work of the ministry. We can start tonight. We can do this all week. We can show up Monday night with somebody. We can join the team. Lord, we capture a vision right now of just sharing again with those in our circle. The good news. The good news. Right now, just let a reminder of the gospel, the good news, rush back over you until you want to tell everybody because you know good news gets out. So if it's that way in you, it's going to be expressed. If, if that's not happening, then we need a fresh, a fresh work of the Holy Spirit in our lives to be reminded of where we were when Jesus found us. Come on. Be reminded of the mercy of God to us. We are not entitled. We did not deserve it. We could not earn it. He came. Thank you, Jesus. He came to us, called us by name, and saved us, forgave us. We have to tell somebody. We have to tell somebody.